To me, they were sick and diseased men filled with evil who cut innocent women's throats and blew out the brains of babies. And America had raised him up and made him a national idol. I knew then that the American conscience was dead and that the great spirit of this nation, which to me began back in Boston, Virginia, during the American Revolution, that it could never again be revived. What you're saying then is that it doesn't make any difference to you whether this jury finds you innocent or guilty. And it doesn't make any difference to you whether you live or die. And you expect us to believe that you have absolutely no fear of the death penalty? I have a lot of fear. But I have a lot more respect. Long ago, I learned that he's my constant companion. He eats with me, he walks with me, he even sleeps with me. I'm sorry, I, I must have missed something <coughs> back there. Who is this faithful companion of yours? Death. Oh, I see. Now well, tell me, does this, uh, is this death companion business some special part of your Indian beliefs? No. Every one of us is death is his constant companion. He sits with every one of us every second of our lives, only we're too terrified to really think about that. But once you do, it'll completely change your entire outlook on life. Well, how so? You ask yourself, even in the most serious crisis, how important would this really be if I were suddenly told that I just have one more week to live? So you learn to take nothing too seriously. On the other hand, you ask yourself, if this were my last act on Earth, is this what I really want to do? So you learn, on the one hand, to be detached from the temporary things of this world, and on the other hand, you learn to appreciate every little thing in it all the more. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, have you reached a decision? Uh, just fine, thank you. Ernest goes to jail. Well, the third Ernest movie, rather than the second, it is the logical continuation of Ernest Goes to Camp. The two are set in an ostensibly real world in contrast to the magical worlds of the two holiday movies. In both, Ernest goes to actual mundane places. Likewise, the trial of Billy Jack is the immediate follow-up to Billy Jack. Hence, the task now falls to us to find the link between the two sequels. Ernest Goes to Jail is a flawless comedic masterpiece concentrating the joys of Ernest P. Worrell into a brisk 81 minutes. The trial of Billy Jack tries to expand every single element of its predecessor into a monumental epic, Tom Laughlin's definitive Billy Jack manifesto, and as such, I want desperately to love it. But... It is a meandering, confusing, humorless mess which comes dangerously close to an excruciating three hours long, and I cannot believe I have watched it more than once. M more than twice. Um, more times than I would ever care to admit. Let me briefly try to summarize this film. The story is a flashback, as described by Jean, who, as you might recall, is the founder of the Freedom School and Billy Jack's love interest, as she recuperates in a hospital after a Kent State-style massacre at her school. A journalist wants to know what led up to this attack, and conveniently for all of us in the audience, it all started right after the previous movie left off, with Billy Jack going to trial 
for involuntarily manslaughtering a sheriff's deputy with a bullet between the eyes and involuntarily manslaughtering in cold blood the son of the richest man in town with a well-placed karate chop to his windpipe. After a brief trial, Billy serves four years in prison. Meanwhile, the students at the Freedom School take on corruption in all its forms, from the FBI down to the local furniture store with exposés and symposiums. Every single powerful person, it seems, at every level of society wants nothing more than to bring them down. When Billy Jack is released from prison, he embarks on a series of encounters that rehash scenes from the previous movie, oh, but not as good, until he goes away for a drawn-out series of vision quests to learn a better way. Things get worse at the school, Billy murders another member of the Posner family, but at least sort of in self-defense this time, and the National Guard shoots numerous students and Jean and the little boy holding a bunny rabbit. Afterwards, Jean wants to give up, but Billy Jack and all of the students convince her to keep going with a couple of songs about love and peace. The end. So, Ernest goes to jail. Where to begin? The characters both go to jail in these movies, and there are courtroom scenes. The, the thing of it is, in the, in the trial of Billy Jack, Billy never actually obtains electromagnetic superpowers to any appreciable extent. All right, all, all right, let's, let's not be too hasty here. Admittedly, at first, this pairing is not as obvious as the previous one. The trial of Billy Jack is muddled, to say the least, but if we focus only on the character arc of Billy Jack and ignore all of the extraneous elements and symposiums, the striking parallels become readily apparent. Billy Jack the movie ends with Billy Jack the man surrendering himself and sacrificing his freedom to save his friends. But his violent rampage is ultimately justified by its results. He avenges the wrongs done to Jean and to Martin by karate chopping Bernard in the throat. And he rids Barbara of her abusive father, the deputy, by shooting him in the face. He is presented as a hero for his actions, and then doubly so for his subsequent martyrdom. In the sequel, Billy must reckon with the implications of his violent tendencies. The actual trial ends at the start of the movie, and Jean's narration helpfully informs us that so, though the trial of Billy Jack as a person was over and he was sentenced from 5 to 15 years in the state penitentiary, the kids decided that Billy Jack was really kind of a symbol to live by. And the trial of Billy Jack as that kind of an ideal had just begun. You see, the trial in the title is just a metaphor of sorts. I propose herein that the jail in Ernest Goes to Jail is another, quite similar metaphor. In Ernest Goes to Camp, Ernest literally uses violence and terrorism and child soldiers in a power struggle to save Camp Kikaki, thereby earning himself a coveted position of Camp Counselor where he can continue molding young minds into societal conformity. This is presented as an unequivocal victory in camp. However, Ernest Goes to Jail serves as a thematic reckoning with the implications of this victory. The truth is revealed about Ernest's veneration and pursuit of control and conformity, 
the camp where young boys are molded into an ideal of manhood, has given way, as is inevitable, to a jail where men are confined and repressed. While Ernest the man is placed in a literal prison, Ernest the spirit is in a struggle to escape a metaphysical prison. Billy Jack's visions teach him that every person has a shadow demon, the evil inside him. To meet your shadow demon, you need only look for the things in others that make you most angry. Billy Jack learns that his violence comes from a desire for power over other people. While Ernest is not a violent man by any means, his shadow is this same lust for control over others. Ernest's dark side shows itself when he pontificates about his hopes and dreams. I'll be able to move assets around like chess men on a financial chessboard. Someday corporate managers will shudder in their wingtips at my approach, for I will be a bank clerk. Later, when he finds out he's been summoned for jury duty, he is ecstatic with awe at the opportunity to decide what is right and what is wrong, and to hold a man's very life in his hand. Elsewhere, we glimpse how much he covets control through his displays of false bravado. He imagines himself toying with his boss, Mr. Pindlesmythe, who, he imagines, is mere putty in his fingers. He tells Charlotte, his imagined love interest, that the world charm is merciless. He can hardly be resisted, he warns. Felix Nash is Ernest's perfect doppelganger and directly embodies Ernest's shadow demon. Nash has the most power of any character in the film. He is a notorious bank robber in a world where financial assets are synonymous with status and influence. He is the true power inside the prison, telling the warden that it is his turf. When he takes Ernest's place on the jury, he immediately bends its verdict to his will, just as Ernest fantasized. He exerts control over Mr. Pindlesmythe, like putty in his hands, and attempts to force himself on Charlotte in a cruel mockery of the merciless world charm. He imprisons the effervescent and irrepressible rimshot in the garbage can. He single-handedly takes hostage numerous people, including a warden and multiple guards and police officers, with no difficulty whatsoever. Jean confirms for us that Billy Jack's main belief is that a man who doesn't go his own way is nothing, and that the trial was really about neither murder nor involuntary manslaughter, but rather determining a man's right to find his own center and follow his own conscience without hurting or interfering with anybody else's. This too lies at the core of Ernest's struggle against imprisonment. Ernest speaks often of the proverbial ladder of a success. To climb this momentous ladder and win control over other people, Ernest believes he must conform with the crowd. He must have faith in the system. He believes that if he works hard, pays his taxes, and bathes and flosses regularly, that he will inevitably succeed. He thinks he can get promoted by chatting up Mr. Pendlesmith. We had that little talk around the old water cooler about team sports and transmission, jock itch, things that just guys talk about, know what I mean? ...topics that he clearly has no real interest in. When he says in an apparent gaffe that he will find a parking space in the fast lane, he inadvertently reveals that his efforts to conform are counter to his true nature, that he is setting himself up to be destroyed. Crucially, the ladder of success is a damned lie. It is instead the metaphorical coconut tree that we are made to climb with false promises of coconuts, even though we are not wearing the appropriate footwear to climb it. Charlotte, who does everything right, 
never receives her expected promotion, so what chance does a man such as Ernest have? She also points out that the promotion Ernest wants would be undesirable anyway, as it would mean spending that much more time with the misanthropic Mr. Pendlesmythe. Ernest would be further stifled and caged by a clerkship. We also know that the justice system overseeing society is not designed to administer justice, as it systematically imprisons and executes innocents like Ernest. The Billy Jack films present innumerable examples of the lies told by the system to control the common man. Lies about fairness and justice. Trust in the laws, even as they are written and applied unevenly between the powerful and the powerless. Trust in capitalism, even as it is coldly used to rob you. Trust in the police and the military for protection, even as they are used to subjugate and brutalize you instead. In the world of Billy Jack, the coconut tree is immeasurably tall, bears only rotten coconuts, and we are all wearing the wrong kind of shoes. This, certainly, by the way, is why Billy is always taking off his boots. Ernest, at his core, is a free spirit, surrounded by characters berating him with rules on how he should exist. Only Rimshot, his faithful friend, lets him live on his own terms. I believe Rimshot, in this film at least, is Ernest's conscience and spirit animal, much like the eagle in The Trial of Billy Jack. But Ernest insists on trying to conform, a choice that leads to his true self being imprisoned and his dark shadow self, Nash, being unleashed. In prison, Ernest undertakes various schemes to escape, and these all involve him assuming different identities, each with its own illusions of control. The violent gangster with a gun, the geometer with his formulae, the fisherman with his strategies for baiting and ensnaring, the Auntie Nelda with her Young scolding man. and guilt trips. The Young man. The only result of these failed schemes is more shackles for Ernest. Billy Jack, in his visions, learns more about violence and control and the human psyche by participating in ethereal skits about slapping different individuals in their faces. Both characters clearly need to abandon their failing paradigm. Ernest's electromagnetic properties are symbolic of his individuality and his deviation from the oppressive system that despises him. Oh, well, that's okay. I'm not likely to be. Know what I mean? <laughs> the first time, he becomes magnetic after shocking himself while on the job polishing the floor of the bank. The bank itself attacks him and the incident ends with him literally locked inside its vault, imprisoned by his very livelihood. The second time it happens, he shocks himself with one of his gadgets right after brushing his teeth and bathing. You might recall that oral hygiene and regular bathing were among his noted keys to success. Dan. It is the trappings of a fancy restaurant that then oppose him, ending with his face and identity concealed by a serving dish and his very humanity squelched by a lobster. In both instances, his electromagnetism is activated by, and also thwarts, his misguided attempts to climb the ladder of success by abandoning the very qualities that make him earnest. Two things happen before the next electric episode that create a critical turning point. The first is Ernest's confrontation with his imminent death in his jail cell before his execution. As Billy Jack tells us, 
Your death is your constant companion, and once you accept that, it totally changes your outlook. You become simultaneously detached and appreciative of every little thing. You reconsider if each thing you do is really what you want to be doing. Ernest gives a monologue in the company of the Grim Reaper, where he looks fate square in the eye, vows to lie down with the lions so that he can soar with the eagles. A dichotomy of the passive and the active, the detached and the engaged. He surrenders whatever illusions of control he still might possess. The second thing that happens is that Ernest gives another monologue, this time at the foot of the electric chair. Here he renounces his role pretending to be Nash, the creature of control, and reasserts his identity as Ernest, the man who can hardly be defined and thus cannot be confined. His only concrete declaration on the subject of what is an earnest is that it is a man who should be set free. This is why, upon this third electrocution, which is administered by the state, his powers manifest as a weapon to be wielded against those who have oppressed him and against the very prison that holds him. He has found his center and he can begin going his own way. And upon freeing himself from the prison, he reclaims his home and frees his conscience Rimshot from the garbage can. And Rimshot accompanies him to cheer him on during the final battle. The fourth and final electrocution is delivered by a cage, the starkest symbol of control. But now, as a self-actualized free man, Ernest is not susceptible to its repressive attack. This time, the Earth itself loses its grip on Ernest, and he gains the ability to fly. He no longer has to climb anything, be it a ladder or a coconut tree, and he is completely freed and uncontrollable. In this state, Ernest doesn't do much of anything actively. He floats and careens about aimlessly. Indeed, his only action during this battle is to switch off the floor polisher, the pointless machinations of his repressive job. Instead, it is Nash, out of his pathological need to dominate, who attempts to control the uncontrollable flying Ernest. This choice is what leads to his downfall, being hung upside down from the ceiling by the malfunctioning floor polisher and falling violently to the ground in a direct repeat of Ernest's misfortune at the beginning of the film when he too sought after absolute control. The men are both on Ernest's chaotic turf now, and Nash is powerless to prevail. Ernest must still save his friends by disposing of a bomb, but he does so by soaring like an eagle, much to the consternation of the oppressive warden who is watching from outside. Nash tries to reassert his dominance by taking everyone hostage, but the universe thwarts him. Ernest, having accepted his tumultuous independence and plunged himself into a cataclysmic eruption, not unlike the creative chaos of the Big Bang, is flung back to Earth, crashing down onto Nash randomly in an outright mockery of the villain's craving for control. The trial of Billy Jack ends with Billy Jack once again surrendering to the police to spare the school. Albeit unsuccessfully this time, he is shot by a corrupt cop and comes very close to dying. His spirit guide, the Maiden, sends him back to the world of the living so that he can continue his spiritual growth. Then, in the film's final scene, he listens to the student's rendition of John Lennon's Give Peace a Chance, affirming by proxy Billy's recommitment to the values of love and pacifism. 
Ernest goes to jail ends with Ernest sacrificing himself to save his friends and suffering a what should be fatal explosion. As with Billy Jack, death itself seems to reject Ernest as the heavens, the angels, drop him back to earth where, singed and shaken, he recites the classic line, I came, I saw, I got blowed up. Its full meaning comes from what he does not say. The line is, of course, a humorous and quite clever variation on Julius Caesar's Veni Vidi Vici, meaning I came, I saw, I conquered. Ernest pointedly does not claim to be a conqueror, signifying that he has fully escaped the prison of his quest for power over others. Instead, he is blowed up because his character has been dismantled by all of his tribulations and now he can reconstruct it in a way that is true to himself. He is blowed up because he has successfully annihilated the shadow half of his being. He is blowed up because his spirit now unencumbered, is freed to go in any and every direction at once, like the wild bursting particles in a world-shattering explosion. Now, as an end note, I am fully aware of the alternate ending, where Ernest is promoted to a bank clerk after saving the bank from Nash, gets magnetized again and chased by filing cabinets again. Personally, I despise that ending because I believe it comes out of nowhere and undermines the themes. Ernest would have learned nothing. It would be exactly as if Billy Jack in an ostensibly happy ending, came back after the massacre and murdered the governor out of revenge. Know what I mean? What? What is happening? I think I'm being shown a vision. Laurel. Nash. Looks like I got myself another hostage. Too bad. I thought you were dead. Not yet. You are me. Why? Because there is, there is no me. tangible proof that... So, it comes to this. Man to man, mano a mano. Toe to toe, nose to nose. Shirts and skins, eggs over me. I'm sorry, I just can't understand all that's happening here. But that's your trouble. You always try to think and understand everything with your head instead of just feeling it with your heart. Now go and just experience what the maiden offers you.